nanohub.org. Online simulation and more for nanotechnology. Today's talk is on nanomedicine. Um, it is by Dr. Jarrett Ashcroft. He's of Pasadena. He's at Pasadena City College uh, in uh, Pasadena, California. Um, uh, he has a chemistry degree from Long Beach State uh, and a, a doctorate uh, working in this area at, from uh, Rice University. Uh, he's also the um, principal investigator uh, and actually the king of um, the uh, MNTEC. Um, you can see he actually, he might be, I, I noticed him earlier, he isn't wearing his crown that he normally wears, but um, he, he usually has that on because that's the way he is. Uh, and then um, he has a mystery title I saw on his on his slide. It says nanomedicine, and I couldn't see what it was in the PDF version. So I'm really curious as to what it is. So I'm going to turn this over to uh, Dr. Ashcroft. Thanks, Bob. Um, so we are doing nanotechnology, the future of medicine. And I kind of show here just a, that's an antibody, sort of the schematic for an antibody with some nanoparticles attached to it. In this case, gold and silver, which we'll talk about later. And what I, I think the mystery title is, is nanotechnology, the future of medicine or the end of the world. Um, yeah, you know, so these are a lot of depictions of sort of um, <laughs> theoretical uh, ideas where we're going to be putting nanobots in humans or we're going to be creating the gray swarm or if you're Michael Crichton, you're going to be um, creating these nano devices that are going to think on their own and just overtake us. And that's all science fiction. Um, you know, none of this nano medicine is going to overtake the human race. Um, but I do think it's great for kind of cool pictures and it's really kind of interesting to make a make a talk but there's actually a really interesting conversation in the literature before with uh smalley and who was his name eric uh gosh i can't remember his last name um who had this really big beef about like, dressler. Oh, dressler dressler yeah eric dressler yeah, yeah. um saying that eric dressler's like oh nano goo is gonna destroy the world and smalley came back and said you know you're crazy this is not dangerous whatsoever um, but we are studying it, and in the future, there definitely could be some type of nanobots that we do use for medicinal purposes, but um, that's probably 20, 30, 40, 50 years away. Um, probably not going to happen in my lifetime. Uh, but what I do hope to get from this talk is just kind of share you what is nanomedicine, what is nanobiology, where are we at in it? It's probably around 20 to 30 years old now where people are seriously been thinking about it. Um, and we are seeing a lot of... Uh, you know, applications now that have come out recently um, using nanotechnology in medicines. So, you know, what, what is nano? Um, I kind of like this slide because we see the word nano all over the place. You know, we have the nano car, we have the nano Hummer, um, you have Overwatch where it has nano boost. Um, and really this isn't nano. This is like kind of a way that we've uh, monopolized it, made it so that people can make money from it. Um, but, you know, where is the applications and specifically where's the applications of nano in biology and medicine? Um, this is kind of an interesting one. I think this is a, a, a really quick video and I've got some, I got a bunch of videos I'm going to show to kind of intersperse between the talk. And this is actually nanomaterials that are being developed by an MIT to be used in the, in the military. And there actually is some medical applications um, within this uh, sort of nano suit that they're creating. The Nano Enhanced Super Soldier possesses abilities and tools unsurpassed by any military technology in the world. Nano Reactive Muscle Propulsion increases jump height by up to six times. Anticipatory Projectile Deceleration predicts and protects against a variety of gunfire. Spasmodic restabilizers snap fractured bones back into place and form an instant cast around the injury. The situational assessment visor goes beyond night and heat vision to identify allies, enemies, and mission objectives. 
Finally, Adaptive Stealth makes the soldier invisible to all electronic forms of detection and even the human eye. So that's kind of a, that was a nano suit that MIT started actually developing around 2010 or so when this video came out. Um, and there's a lot of interesting, I think, medical applications here. And some of the things are actually really legit. Um, like, for instance, if you do get a broken arm using kind of the nanomaterials that can change shape um, through, you know, chemical changing or interactions, um, it could be a, a set for a broken arm. Um, I think one of the more interesting ones is like the sensors that you could put in the nano suits, like sensors that can detect uh, toxins or some type of poison. Um, and if they detect it, then the suit would automatically close down and like make it where that would protect you from the poison and, you know, act as sort of the, uh, a barrier so that the, the toxins don't get into you. Um, another really interesting one with this suit is if someone went into cardiac arrest, um, if you were wearing this nano suit, your body would actually recognize that you were going to have a heart attack. And if you needed CPR or something that the suit would actually do it by itself. Um, so to me, those are really kind of cool applications that uh, maybe for the future, and who knows where this has gone over the last 10 years, the military is probably not going to be sharing their, their really, really advanced um, science with us. But, you know, this is all of it kind of has applications in sensing different uh, bodily functions or different environmental interactions and being able to change shapes, change sort of properties of materials, nanomaterials within these suits in order to help alleviate some of the, um, you know, bad outcomes that can happen from some of these situations. I kind of like to go from all right, soldiering, which I, I, I don't want to dismiss. And I think it is important if we are keeping soldiers as safe as possible. But wouldn't we rather save lives with nano as opposed to, you know, use it in, as a weapon or, or in, in, in wartime? Um, so here's a little bit of a cool video on, you know, how can we use nano and how can we use it in kind of partnership with other type of biomolecules or other type of medicines in order to deliver um, those medicines to different places that need it. You know, like if you have a, a colon cancer or, you know, lung cancer, can we develop a, a specific cell specific medicine using nanomaterials um, for these type of delivery systems? So, Here's kind of one theoretical nanoparticle-based drug delivery system to fight cancer. Cancer cells isolated from human tumors can be used to help the development of novel cancer therapies. For most drugs to be therapeutically active, they must go inside the cell. Nanoparticles carrying drug payloads can be used to facilitate the drug delivery. Nanoparticles can be targeted to receptors that are overexpressed on the surface of cancer cells. They then enter the cells via a process called endocytosis. Antibody fragments engineered on the nanoparticle bind to the receptors, initiating the eternalization process. Inside the cell, clathrin proteins form a cage around the developing endocytic vesicle, which is then cleaved from the cell membrane. The newly formed vesicle carrying the nanoparticle travels further inside the cell, where it is captured and fuses with an early endosome. Inside the acidic endosomal compartment, the nanoparticle degrades, releasing the therapeutic cargo, which induces a controlled death of the cancer cell. Nanoparticle-based drug delivery provides a novel and targeted approach for the future of cancer therapy. 
So this is, you know, project has probably been worked on for the last 20 years. And um, we're going to get into like the different nanomaterials that we could be using, the different biomolecules that we could interact with it. And then maybe even talk a little bit about well, like, like, where are we? Is this a practical um, way that we could use nanotechnology to fight uh, cancer or other diseases? Um, and, and also, you know, what's the future going to be going going forward uh, and why would we do it? And is it, is it any better than what we have medicine now, which is really a big key in, in medicine is like, you can create a great idea if it's not either cheaper and just as efficient, or if it's not way, way, way super efficient compared to the medicine that we have now, it's probably not going to become a, a drug that companies use. You know, so we're going to talk a little bit here, uh, nanobiology, and you've probably have seen this one, you know, this is kind of one of the interesting uh, applications that, that we've actually been looking at at, at, at Pasadena City College is biomimicry. Um, using you know what nature has given us in order to create sensors nano sensors that, that can be used in medicine like the blue morpho butterfly wing um, the fact that these structures uh, cause the blue color through interactions with light um, to give that blue morpho that blue 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 color um, could be used in uh, creation of nano sensors that we could embed in people's eyes or that we can embed in skin that are very, very small. And that then we could just shine light on in order to like monitor glucose levels or mon monitor gl glaucoma in the eye. Um, it gives us another way that we could um, possibly measure, uh, you know, bodily uh, amounts of, of chemicals in order to sort of produce, like this is the best way that we can fight a disease. Um, so that's another way that nanotechnology and medicine is, is sort of coming along. So let's kind of talk about you know, like where, where are some of the, the current um, interests for nanoparticles? And I think we can just look at COVID-19, um, both in the detection of, of COVID and in the vaccines. Um, many of the tests that, that you actually get for your COVID um, to see if you have COVID are nano-based. Um, they've created some gold nanoparticle or some type of nanoparticle complexes that they've put within some of these tests that if it's positive for COVID, they're going to interact with these gold nanoparticles. You're going to have a reaction. You're going to change the color. And that's what they're measuring whenever they get either a positive or negative, negative result. Um, all the COVID, well, not all of them, but the Moderna and Pfizer vaccine all contain nanotechnology. Um, they're nanoliposomes. So they're organic uh, nanoparticles. They're not metal nano, nanoparticles. Um, and they are fairly new, like they haven't been used in medicine a lot, but they've been studied for, gosh, probably 15, 20 years. Um, the first time I heard about nanoliposomes was from a guy called Andreas Hirsch in Germany, and he was studying, studying them in conjunction with antibodies to use as cell-specific um, drug delivery systems. But they basically have taken these nanoliposomes, they've attached the mRNA of the COVID vaccine to it, um, and that's how the vaccines, at least the, the materials for the vaccine vaccines are created. Um, so if you go and look at the, uh, the, the materials list for the COVID-19 vaccines, you'll see the mRNA, but you'll also see all of the chemicals needed to make these nanoliposomes. Um, kind of the cool thing about it is that whenever you're making a medicine, there's really three things you want. You want it, one, to be water soluble because our body are water-based. We've got to make sure that it's going to actually uh, be able to be inside our body and you need it water solubility. You want it to be effective, right? So you want a efficacy. Um, and then the third thing you want is you want it to get to the place that's going to be doing uh, its specific, uh, you know, application. You know, so like for the COVID vaccine, you want to make sure that it's going to interact with the proteins in your body to block the COVID whenever it comes into you from interacting and causing you to get sick. Um, and that's kind of what the COVID vaccines do. And then, uh, then you've also got sort of these tests. Um, I want to just kind of show a video on nanoliposomes. These are not a new technology. They've been studied in the, in the past. In fact, Keystone Nano um, is at Penn State University. So they've been studying nanoliposomes um, there for some time. Keystone Nano assembles nanoparticles containing a therapeutic drug. With trillions of particles per ounce, an IV solution packs a big punch. The nanoparticles circulate in the bloodstream. Their structure and size, which is much smaller than a blood cell, allows them to travel in the body longer than free drugs. To support growth, tumors create blood vessels to supply nutrients. 
but typically the vessels created by tumors are poorly constructed and provide small gaps to access the tumor. Particles slip into cells and selectively kill tumor cells and shrink tumors. More information is available at keystonenano.com. I'm sure that was Bob's group that, that made the nanoliposomes, right, Bob? Is that you guys? Um, you know, but again, these are, these are known particles. They're, they're safe. And part of the reason that they're safe and we know it is they're, they're carbon-based. And anytime you can use a carbon-based material for medicine, it's, it's, it's kind of preferable than the, organic, than the inorganic-based, um, mainly because since our body's made out of carbon, it's less likely that those carbon-based molecules are going to have negative effects with this. The other thing that we do is we make sure that we take those nanoliposomes of carbon and we attach other groups to them that help make it safe. Um, kind of a good example is benzene. Like if you, if you know benzene, which is the solvent, they used to wash hands with it to get the grease off, but they found it was carcinogenic. Um, if you take benzene all by itself, it, is, it does cause cancer because the forces that it has, which is dispersion forces, whenever you put it in your body, it doesn't really interact or get into the, the water very well. And so it can build up in your body. And that's what kind of causes cancer a lot of times is buildup of molecules or uh, you know, substances in the body that you can't get out. Um, however, if you take benzene and you just put a, an ester group right? Like a carbon double bond oxygen to, a, to another oxygen or a carboxylic acid, carbon double bond oxygen to an OH. Now you have aspirin, right? So just by putting and adding onto it two different groups that are water soluble, you take something that is carcinogenic and you make it into the most widely used pain reliever medicine out there in aspirin. And you do the same thing with nanoparticles. You're going to take these carbon-based or inorganic-based particles. We're going to attach other things to them so that we make them safer to put into our body. And that's kind of what they've done with the, the, the vaccines is they've taken these nanoliposomes, which if you put them all by themselves in the body, it would be harder for it to get out. But by attaching other uh, things to it. I think they use polyethylene glycol, which is PEG, which basically makes it more water soluble. Um, plus put the mRNA vaccine on it. Now you have water solubility, easier to get any kind of the toxic um, stuff that you want out of the body. And you got the mRNA vaccine that is going to be doing its work. So you make a more effective drug. Um, that's one thing that you can kind of do with these nanoparticles is it can be a scaffold for other biomolecules or other medicines that we can put on them in order to create new drugs uh, that uses the best of nanotechnology and the best of modern drug technology to create a new possible medicine that we could use today. This is actually a really interesting um, drug, and it was the very first uh, nanoparticle albumin bound um, breast cancer drug. It's actually probably the first cancer drug that they've ever studied. It was called the Braxane. It was for metastatic breast cancer. They basically took um, the drug Paclitaxel or Taxol for short, which is a breast cancer drug. And then they attached it to a nanoparticle. Um, and then they tried to sell it for $10,000 per year. Um, not per year, but per dose. Um, Probably the problem with this, and this is where we have to really get into the ethics of nanotechnology and medicine, is this drug really didn't improve how well Taxol worked. It didn't, you know, the, the, the study showed that this Abraxane was not any less or more effective than the Taxol drug just used by itself. Um, this was more of a, a drug company trying to make a nano-based drug, calling it nano-based, repackaging it, and at the end of the day, using it as a way to try and make a lot more money as opposed to really increasing effectiveness of a, of a cancer drug. Um, there are still side effects, longer breathing problems, decreased blood count, infections, nerve problems. So I think whenever we're talking about nanomedicine, we really always should talk about, you know, there's a lot of potential, but there is a lot of also potential for drug companies and people to take advantage of it, you know, by putting nano in front of it or making, oh, this is a new technology. A lot of times it's sort of a false positive in how helpful is this really going to be? Like if you just create a, a drug, put a nanoparticle on it, use it, charge people an arm and a leg to use it, but it's any but it's not as any more effective than what we already have out there. Um, to me, that's kind of just a scam. So what we're really trying to do, at least in my mind, as good scientists, is how do we create drugs that are going to be more effective, 
more safer, more efficient than what we have on the market today. And if we can do that, then I think there's a lot of promise for nanotechnology, like the vaccines, right? Like the vaccines really needed those nanoparticles is that delivery system in order to help that mRNA work and give the the behavior. Um, having those gold nanoparticles in the, the COVID test was, was a huge benefit. One, they're not very expensive. They're pretty cheap. Um, but also they're, they're very good at detecting and they give a really strong signal uh, for, for, you know, showing a positive COVID test. Um, so in those instances, we've got, mater- you know, nanotechnology materials that were positively benefiting society. The case of Abraxane was literally just a drug company trying to make money off of nanotechnology, making it sound something that it really wasn't, um, and just charging a lot more money for it, uh, which a lot of times they get away with because it's just the, the insurance companies that end up paying for it. Um, and they just pass on the cost to the, the customers kind of surreptitiously. Um, so again, not all nanoparticle drugs are necessarily needed, um, and not all of them are going to be as a, as a, as they're not necessarily going to be as effective, or if they are just as effective, they cost more money and they don't do any, any more than what was already done. So what can we change on nanoparticles, right? Like, you know, here's the sort of the different things we have nanoparticles. So one thing that you can change is what's the material. Um, we've got, uh, Fullerenes is what I worked on. So I worked with fullerenes, which is C60. It's just a soccer ball of carbon. Um, And we'll talk a little bit about why that might be beneficial. You can use carbon nanotubes, right? Like, so maybe probably really short carbon nanotubes, you'd have to cut them up, um, but you could use ultra short carbon nanotubes. Um, We could use graphene, right? We could use metallic nanoparticles, gold nanoparticles, silver nanoparticles. Um, We could make kind of the polymers of nanoparticles. We could use the nanoliposomes, um, dendromeres. You know, there's a lot of different types of nanoparticles that we could use in medicine and, and we could change it and see, you know, not only are they different delivery mechanisms, but do any of these nanoparticles have properties that can actually help fight disease? Like in the case of metallic nanoparticles, we'll talk about it in a little bit. Um, they actually have some properties that can not just be the delivery mechanism, but also the, the therapeutic agent. Um, the other thing we can change is size, right? We could go anywhere from one nanometer to a hundred nanometers. Now you have to kind of think about, you know, do you want a really, really large medicine? Um, and the answer to that's probably no, because if you want to get things into cells, typically they're going to have to be 20 nanometers, 30 nanometers in size. Anything below that's fine too, if it's one to five nanometers. These bigger ones, 100, 200 nanometers, um, it's not as easy to get those inside the cell through endocytosis or other mechanisms. So making the optimal size, so it actually can be used as a medicine in in, in that the cells or wherever you're trying to deliver it to can pull the, the nanoparticles into your, your, your cell is really important. Uh, there's different shapes, you know, like you can have spheres, stars, cubes, rods. Um, I know Dr. Yadong Yin, who I've worked with at UC Riverside, he can pretty much make any na- metallic nanoparticle, any shape you want. Um, you know, the way that you change the shape is really by changing forces, right? You can, if you want to make a bigger, if you want to make a rod versus a sphere, even make it size, you just change the capping agents on these metallic nanoparticles. Um, The stronger uh, force that's pushing in on the nanoparticles is going to make it smaller, or you could change the uh, capping agents, which are just polymers that you're wrapping the nanoparticles in, depending on which polymers that you choose, like polyethylene glycol or citrate or some different capping agent, depending on how strong the interactions they are with the nanoparticles. So think, think intermolecular forces or positive negative interactions. If you have a negative charge on it, like citrate, that negative charge is going to be pushing in on that positive charge nanoparticle, which silver or gold is positive charge. So you would expect that to make a smaller nanoparticle particle because you have this stronger push of those negative ions on the positive charge. Or if you wanted to use PEG, for instance, which is a neutral um, polymer, it's just got basically OH interactions. And so they're going to be interacting through the alcohol groups on the PEG, yet not as strong interactions. So maybe they don't push 
in on the nanoparticles as much, which is going to make it so it could grow larger. Um, or if you mix and match those different capping agents, maybe you can create these different sizes and shapes. Um, it's actually a really cool science of just how do you create different shapes of nanoparticles. Kind of the last thing that we could change, and this is the main thing that I did, is what can we put on the surface of these nanoparticles? Um, can we create covalent interactions, like using cross-linking agents to make nanoparticle biomolecule conjugates, right? Can we organically connect nanoparticles to say antibodies or proteins or, or some other, even a medicine like Taxol? You could you also use intermolecular forces and you don't necessarily have those covalent linkages, but you could just have intermolecular force attractions that's holding those nanoparticles within some type of biomolecule. Um, like for example, fullerene is only about one nanometer, right? It's really tiny. Um, biomolecules like proteins are huge. I mean, they're, you know, hundreds, maybe thousands of nanometers. So, you know, can those very, very large biomolecules just wrap themselves around these nanoparticles and have those type of interactions to hold the nanoparticles within sort of its three-dimensional shape? Um, you know, and it's, it's easy to do surface chemistry. It's very well known at this point of uh, attaching different organic functional groups on the surface of pretty much any type of nanoparticle. Um, I know they've done it on metallic nanoparticles. They've put carboxylic acids on them, amines on them, uh, carbon nanotubes and fullerenes, the same thing. They put a lot of different functional groups and functionality to the surface of these particles, which can then be used to attach other uh, biomolecules or medicines to the nanoparticles. You know, so here's sort of the inorganic nanoparticles. Um, I like the the size one here that shows gold going from really tiny, you know, one nanometer up to a little bit larger, uh, 100 to 200 nanometers. You can see the color changes. So that's one thing, like properties changes, size changes. And even in medicine, right? Like those different properties at different sizes can affect um, cells and, and cancer cells and stuff at, at different uh, degrees. Um, you got protein interactions, nano interactions between the gold or the silver and, and some protein. Uh, here we can show just, you know, here's a gold nanoparticle on the upper, upper right. And you could, you could attach fluorate, fluorescent imaging uh, to it. Or you could even just use the nanoparticles as the fluorescence imaging uh, device, like in quantum dots, um, cadmium or, uh, you know, the different quantum dots have fluorescent properties. Um, you could attach things that show shape recognition or gene delivery, um, antigen binding, different linkers, drug carriers. So again, we could attach a lot of different uh, functionality to these gold or silver, or uh, I use titanium nanoparticles for, for a little while in one study. Um, they were a little bit more difficult because titanium nanoparticles basically conglomerate. They just all stick together too much. And that's another thing that we have to remember is if you put these inorganic nanoparticles into a solution, what they're going to want to do is all go together. They're going to clump together because they all have kind of the same properties. So one thing we have to be cognizant of whenever we create medicine is how do we separate in solution these nanoparticles into their individual particles and not have where they're just clumping up um, in the solution, which happens a lot. Um, so this is a inorganic nanoparticles. The other part is the organic nanoparticles. Um, most of my research was actually on fullerene. It's a C60. You can kind of see the C60 here. And things that we can do to the, you know, fullerenes is we can attach different uh, molecules on the outside. So on the left here, we have uh, three different carboxylic acid groups. It has ended up six total, but we have three different sites. And this is actually the C3 molecule, which about 20 years ago, his name was Steve Wilson. Um, he actually patented this drug called the C3 molecule. It, it was shown to be the best radical scavenger out there um, for a, a long time. And basically, a radical scavenger is what you put in your body for antioxidants, right? Like your body has radicals in it that causes aging. It causes all the brain diseases like dementia, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's disease. And the reason you eat blueberries or the, the um, really dark leafy um, vegetables is because those antioxidants go and they're going to eat up all those radicals in your body, which are going to be in there just from everyday life. Um, and the less radicals that we have, the less likely we are to have these, these brain diseases. Um, so the interesting thing about 
the C3 drug is that they put it in rats um, and mice. And the mice that they put it in actually lived um, about a year longer than the other, the other mice and rats um, because, you know, radicals is what causes aging. You know, and so he patented this. He made, a, he made this big old factory to mass produce it. And then he tried it in humans and it didn't work. And his company ended up unfortunately going out of business because um, one thing you should always do when developing a drug is make sure that it works in humans before you mass produce it. Um, you know, he didn't do that. And so it ended up that the drug just kind of went away. It's an interesting drug. It's called C3. If you know uh, point group theory in chemistry, um, if you did inorganic chemistry, if you look at this drug, it's actually like a triangle of um, the carboxylic acids, the COOH. If you think of it as a belt, if you rotate it three times, you actually come back to the exact same molecule. And that's why it's called the C3 drugs. It's C3 point group. Um, and it's kind of just a cool drug that they made. Very easy. Um, it's kind of this beautiful red color too. Uh, really, really great in rats. Really, really great in mice. Didn't work so well in humans. Um, and so therefore, I don't think we really want to keep mouse, mice and rats alive that long. Um, at least from my point of view, maybe. I don't know. Um, but it just didn't come to fruition. Um, on the right here, you know, here's another molecule that, that we actually created in my lab at, uh, at Rice, uh, Tatiana Zakaria, and did this. Uh, she actually attached Taxol to the outside of the fullerene molecule. And again, you can see that it's all organic functional groups, right? Like you use this crosslinker, you see this uh, amid group, the NH with the double bond oxygen, carbon double bond oxygen. Uh, that group did a cross-linking to this Taxol molecule. And Taxol is used for breast cancer drugs. Um, another person in our group actually attached what's called Serenol um, to another uh, you know, bond on the fullerene. And the Serenol actually has about six different OH groups, alcohol groups, and that's what's used to water solubilize it. Um, on the right here, this molecule would not be water soluble. You would not want to use this as a medicine because you'd put it in your body and it would just stay there forever because if it's not water soluble, it can't get into the bloodstream and it's very, very difficult to um, get it out through you know, either peeing or excreting it somehow. Um, by putting on those serenol groups, the OHs, right? Like here you have OHs. Anytime you see alcohols or carboxylic acids, that's going to increase water solubility. And that's really ideal in medicine because that increased water solubility allows this drug to go be delivered to where we want it to go. And then also once it's done doing its medicine, it could be excreted out because Taxol is a toxic chemical, right? Like Taxol doesn't do, I mean, we're basically putting a more, we're, we're putting a harmful toxin into the body to, to kill cancer cells so that we kill something with something that's bad for us, killing something that's even worse for us. You know, that's how a lot of medicines work. Um, you know, so that was kind of an interesting drug that they made. Um, here's sort of what an area that we're working on. Um, we're trying to take... Uh, you know, this silver nanoparticle, and you can kind of see this silver with the gold around it. Um, kind of a cool property that, well, that gold has is gold nanoparticles are not really toxic in bodies. Like gold nanoparticles don't really hurt humans very much. Silver nanoparticles, unfortunately, are toxic for the bodies and they have really great an antibacterial properties. So silver on one hand is great for antibacterial properties in humans. On the other hand, it's toxic. And so putting it in our body isn't ideal, whereas the gold isn't toxic. So one thing that we're working on at, at Pasadena City College right now is we're making, well, Dr. Yin at UC Riverside is making these silver gold hybrid nanoparticles. So basically he's taking the silver and wrapping it with gold. And the idea here is, you know, if we create this silver core, does it keep its antibacterial properties? And at the same time, wrapping it with the gold, will that make it non-toxic, right? So now we'd have a antibacterial nanoparticle that doesn't show the toxic behavior of the silver. Um, and you know, we have actually had ways of cross-linking these inorganic molecules, very similar to how they did it with the fullerene back here. Um, we use a molecule called EDC, and we basically do organic chemistry, and we connect the silver at gold nanoparticle to 
uh, some biomolecule, you know, in this case, maybe an antibody. And the reason why the antibody is because antibodies are going to be very specific for certain cells. So I could, I could attach a, a lung cancer antibody, or I could attach a breast cancer antibody or a colon cancer antibody. I could choose my antibodies. And once we create a pedagogy, you know, a, a model of doing this cross-linking, we could pretty much change any of the biomolecule for any type of nanoparticle. And now we have a system to make multiple nano uh, medicines that could interchange the different biomolecules with the different nanoparticles. Um, one thing we're going to be studying this year is, you know, no one really knows if these silver and gold nanoparticles keep its antibacterial behavior or are non-toxic. Um, so one thing we're going to be doing is actually taking these nanoparticles and putting it into cells and seeing like, well, do we, what we think going to happen, is it going to be non-toxic and does it still kill the bacteria like what we're hoping um, and seeing what goes there. Uh, this was actually my research on the right. Um, I took the, the fullerene. So we took fullerene here. We added these serenol. This is the serenol group here at the bottom. Um, and we cross-linked it to this, what's called SPDP cross-linker. And we cross-linked the fullerene to the antibody. Um, so this was one of my papers. I was the first one that attached an antibody to a nanoparticle. Um, and kind of the interesting thing about the paper is that we were never able to prove it was a covalent linkage. Um, in fact, we think it was more of a uh, what's called passive absorption, meaning that the nanoparticle in the fullerene, instead of being covalently linked, um, were just interacting with each other. And because of the, the largeness or big size of the antibody, it just wrapped itself around the fullerene and kept it trapped within uh, the nanoparticle. Um, kind of another interesting part of the story is um, fullerenes are really, really, really small, one nanometer antibodies are really, really, really big, like huge. I mean, probably a hundred times bigger. So how do you prove that we've actually have the interactions and how did we prove that the antibody and fullerene were kind of interacting together? And the way we did it was with a, a process called triplet triplet absorption. So we basically shot um, our nanoparticle conjugate with a laser and it did this really cool sort of energy transfer electron transfer that's really specific called triplet triplet absorption where the electrons get moved into this um, energy level and then as the electrons go down and up they were able to change the laser energy so that it only would affect this triplet triplet absorption and not the other types of absorptions and by doing that we were able to show that at least that the antibody and the fullerene were in the same solution um, and the other thing that we were able to do is something called thermogravimetric analysis, which is just a really good way of saying we heated the hell out of it. And we saw as we heated it, uh, how much mass came off, right? If, whenever we did the fullerene or antibody by itself, you see the mass come off at a certain time and a certain size. Uh, once, we, once we did the fullerene and antibody together, it increased the size, it increased the time it took to actually destroy the particle, which helped prove that we did probably have these two biomolecules and nanoparticles, um, at least in the same solution and interacting with each other in some form, um, which was, you know, kind of a, a fun experiment. Here's kind of an interesting one that, uh, you know, another property with gold nanoparticles and was being looked at forever is whenever you put them inside the, the cell, if you shine light on them, you can actually get vibrations. Um, and by shining a, a certain energy of light, those vibrations, once they get into the cell, can also destroy cancer. So you're not going to be destroying cancer with a therapeutic. You're actually just going to be doing it with the nanoparticles directly and shining energy on it. Um, so this was a work done by Naomi Hallis at Rice University. Um, and again, you're going to get cell specific drug delivery. So attach an antibody that's going to be really, really specific for the cell. And then once it gets into the cell, then you can do all of the uh, energy, you know, shine the light on it. And then once you shine the light on it, cause it to vibrate. And then those vibrations would end up killing the, the cancer cells that way. So here's sort of a, uh, an example video of what, of what that would look like. The centerpiece of the MagForce Nano Cancer Therapy is the nanoparticle consisting of iron oxide. The particle is covered by a patented coating which ensures a good stability and division of the iron oxide particles in the tumor tissue. The small size of the particle is decisive for the therapy. 
The diameter measures some 20 nanometers and is thus 500 times smaller than a red blood cell. One milliliter of the particle solution contains nearly 17 trillion single nanoparticles. This high density makes efficient treatment possible. At the beginning of the therapy, the nanoparticles are injected directly into the tumor. The tumor in this particular case is a glioblastoma, a malignant brain tumor characterized by aggressively growing cells. On the microscopic level, the healthy cells can be seen on the left and the tumor cells on the right. After being injected, the nanoparticles spread out in the spaces between the tumor cells. The patient now enters the therapy device in which an alternating magnetic field is produced which is of no danger to humans. This field affects a 100,000 times alternation of the magnetic poles within the particles per second, creating warmth which is precisely regulated from outside. This application is repeated and the thermal effect increases visibly. The particles begin to oscillate, causing the cancer cells to die either from active self-destruction or from swelling until they literally burst. Tumor growth is stopped and the destroyed cells are discharged by the body in a natural process. As a rule, the one hour minimal invasive treatment is repeated six times. However, the particles are only injected once, thus making the therapy especially gentle on the patient. And it does look like a really great application. The big problem that they ended up having with this um, idea is how do you get the energy that you need like from light or from making the vibrations far enough into the body to make the um, nanoparticles vibrate like what we needed to um, so that was kind of like the big obstacle there is you know whether you use uv light shining it on your skin does it penetrate enough so it actually interacts with the nanoparticles or even the um, magnetic behavior that they have. So, yeah, that's another application that, that possibly could be, you know, in, in the future used for cancer therapies. Right now it's not because there just is not enough data or, you know, optimal nanoparticles for, for use in it. Um, kind of another really cool application, if you look down here at the bottom, bottom right, there's the therapeutic part of nano uh, medicine. Um, there's also the imaging aspect of it. And I think imaging a lot of times is not looked at as important, but in reality, you know, the best way that we can fight cancer is earlier detection, right? If you detect it early enough, it's actually very easy to keep people in remission and to keep it so that the cancer doesn't spread. Um, cancer gets really, really dangerous whenever it gets to stage four or, or beyond where it's now uncontrol uncontrollable growth. Um, so one thing that was possible with nanoparticles is better contrast agents. Um, so you can kind of see down here at the bottom, a very typical contrast agent that they use is um, the gadolinium DTPA. Uh, it's DOPA or DOPA something. Um, gadolinium is used a lot of times because gadolinium, uh, the right ion of it has seven unpaired electrons. And if contrast agents or any of these type of agents, they basically are using electron spin in order to create the energy that would then be transformed into the, into the image, which I just find amazing. Like, I don't get how... You use these, you get this energy, you create the wavelengths, those wavelengths then get transformed into an image using some really, really fancy math, um, which to me is amazing in and of itself. But the cool thing about these nanoparticles is uh, the one of the advantages of fullerene or nanotubes is that since it's a cage, right? Like fullerene is a soccer ball and inside the soccer ball is a hollow sphere. So you could actually put inside that fullerene cage uh, any type of, of agents, like in this case, gadolinium. Um, if we put gadolinium inside that cage, there's really two things that, that happened. One, gadolinium, if you use this GDT, DTPA, um, is a little bit toxic for your body, right? So it's very easy um, for these gadolinium reagents or agents, which are chelated to something like a porphyrin ring or some type of organic molecule. It's very easy for that gadolinium to leak out or, you know, be removed from that chelating agent. And chelation just means that you're just holding that gadolinium together with some organic molecules. The cool thing about the fullerene or the nanotubes is 
since it's spherical, you actually have a better control of not leaking out that gadolinium. So that gadolinium is going to stay inside that shell and you're not going to leak it out and harm other um, parts of your body. The other really cool feature is that for some reason, the gadolinium interactions within this case, it was C82, which is a type of fullerene, ended up increasing the contrast quite a bit. So you can kind of see here at the bottom, um, the gadolinium contrast agent just shines a lot brighter than the organic based one that they had. Um, and you can kind of see here the before and after. And the before and after is with the gadolinium nano, uh, nanoparticles. You can really see it starts shining or contrasting to a greater extent. By increasing contrast, by increasing sort of this signaling, it gives us a better chance of detecting cancer cells earlier. Earlier detection is going to be leading to better options for treatment um, and in the end lead to um, just a better increase in, in survivability and being able to live with, in this case, cancer for, for a longer time. Um, so that's another one in contrast agents and imaging agents, um, mag, you know, MRI agents, magnetic resonance imaging and stuff like that that they use. Uh, kind of one of the projects I'm just going to share, mainly because my students did it, um, is our nano bio MAB. And so this is kind of the uh, project that that my students are trying to use to bring everything together. So we want to take the silver nanoparticle core, put the gold nanoparticle on it, be able to attach it to an antibody, and then be able to use that light interaction where we can cause the um, vi oscillations and vibrations to be used as a um, medicine in that way. And so like, this is the particle that we're trying to create in our lab and kind of to end this, we're just going to show you, this is actually a simulation created by my students to show this is how our medicine would theoretically work. The NanoBio MAB, a gold silver nanoparticle hybrid attached to breast cancer specific antibodies counteracts the symbiotic relationship between bacteria and cancer cells with its antibacterial and anti-cancer and non-immunogenic properties. These hybrid nanoparticle bioconjugates have a multitude of uses in cancer and infectious disease identification and treatment at the cellular level, including enhanced drug delivery, biomedical imaging, and phototherapy. The breast cancer-specific antibody NanoBioMAB conjugate directs the hybrid nanoparticle to the cancer cell. The NanoBioMAB penetrates the cell membrane, gaining entrance into the cell. Once inside, cellular proteins wrap around the nanobio MAB, absorbing the hybrid nanoparticle. Nanoparticles originally attached to the antibody separate and release within the breast cancer cells. Utilizing UV light, vibrational energy effectively treats the tumor from within, eradicating cancer in the body without negative effects seen in current chemotherapeutic cancer treatments. With their dual mode therapeutic purposes, the NanoBio MAB will revolutionize cancer therapy. NanoBio MAB, a safer, more effective cancer medicine. That's kind of the project that we're working on at, at PCC and with a, a whole bunch of different universities. Uh, and I kind of always like to end with, um, you know, a picture of students uh, because all these projects that we talked about on, you know, a lot of students uh, worked on them. And we always want to, especially as a community college faculty that I am, want to promote coming up with ideas of what, what can we do for students, give them projects. Um, in order to go forward. And all these students kind of been helping on, on a lot of these projects that, that we talked about. Um, and then kind of last, um, thank you for attending the presentation. I'm Jared Ashcroft, PI and Center Director for Micro Nanotechnology Education Center. And if you're interested in any questions about nanomedicine, or if you're interested in questions just about micro nanotechnology at community colleges and the ATE program, um, please uh, contact me and eventually we're going to actually put my correct grant number on here. My, I have a question. Like, like it sounds like there are, people are working with nanoparticles. I didn't know about the Abraxane story. Like I, I heard, Oh, this Abraxane is really cool. And it, you know, that it actually goes in and it, uh, you know, it, 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 the, there, there aren't the side effects from it because it goes directly to the, you know, it uses nanoparticles, but you're saying that's not that, that the study well, haven't borne that out. It, it was shown not to be any more effective in right. fighting cancer, breast cancer than anything else. It was basically a net neutral company. I mean, there's, it was kind of, it's a little bit controversial because the company charged so much money for it and mm -hmm. it really wasn't this, I mean, what you want to see if you're going to be putting a new medicine out is a big jump or evolution of, of a drug. Mm -hmm. 
Um, you don't want it to just be a little bit better or, you know, it has to be, especially if you're going to charge $10,000 a dose. Um, yeah. That one, that one did not have a huge jump. In fact, it, most of the data that I've seen shows like it, it was at the best equal to tax all by itself mm-hmm. um, or tax all based drugs by itself. So at the end, it didn't really, I don't think people are using it anymore. Um, but that's, that's the problem with medicine is whenever pharmaceutical companies sort of make a novel new medicine, sell it as this novel medicine based on nano. And in reality, it's just basically a tax all attached to a nanoparticle doing the same thing tax all does anyway. Um, that's why a lot of these conjugates where you use nanoparticles attached to other medicines haven't panned out because it hasn't been shown yet that the nanoparticles are enhancing the delivery or enhancing the effects. Um, I think you're going to have like the really specialized nanoparticles, like the vaccines that you really did need that to be Mm -hmm. there to help get the MRNA there. Um, I think that we're going to see some contrast agents because I do think they have a lot better properties. Um, I think that if they can ever figure out the, uh, the energy and how to get that energy there, those, nanoparticles that can do the vibrations could be possibility. Um, But again, I think we're, we're probably five or 10 years away to seeing these nanoparticle based therapies becoming really, really prevalent. So I do think that the vaccine has helped because now they've seen how it can be effective. Mm -hmm. Um, In the, in the past, I just don't think there was a need, right? It's like, we've had all these great cancer medicines and stuff like, now that we've seen a need and a possibility, I think it could it could re-energize this sort of field. Uh, but I thought also, that, Jared, that there was a, um, um, you know, the, the limiting the side effects because you were actually bringing it, you know, basically bringing it right to the cancer cell. Um, and, and, and you wouldn't, you're not killing, you know, using poison, basically, you're not killing the other cells within your, your body uh, as well as rapidly (laughs) as you in theory that's right you know like Uh, in theory if we could attach an antibody that is very very specific for that mm -hmm. cell but there's nothing stopping you from taking an antibody and attaching taxol directly to it without a nanoparticle Mm -hmm. there is no reason like what is the Mm -hmm. reason for the nanoparticle Mm -hmm. like Mm -hmm. and and if you really think about any time we're adding more complexity to the drug it does it just ends up not necessarily being good nanoparticle antibody and drug all in one more compl- and water solubilizing group versus just taking an antibody that's specific for breast cancer and attaching taxol directly to mm. it mm-hmm. right like just the, the simplicity of it i think is better for that case than you know why nanoparticles Mm-hmm. You know, that's, that's, and that's the question I think that fullerene and nanotubes has been left. Like people don't even do it anymore. People started mm-hmm. to look at graphene. Now I think they're not doing that anymore. I mean, there's the quantum dots and stuff like that. I think there's a little bit more interest there, but if you look at the trends, um, a lot of them that they started with, people have moved away from because they just couldn't find why use the nanoparticles, if that mm-hmm. makes sense. I think what we need is something where it's the nanoparticle is the therapeutic agent and not just used for a delivery system. I think there, there definitely is potential, um, you know, but it's what, 2001 is whenever I started working on a lot of this and it was really in its infancy. We were hoping by 2021 that we would start, use, start seeing a little bit more applications, specifically for the contrast agents in the medicine. Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't think that we've really seen a big proliferation of it. But again, with this vaccine that came out, having the nanoliposomes, um, I think that's going to open up, you know, maybe some ideas. But, but we'll see because there's yeah. a whole bunch of other competing drugs that you're competing with that are already really good. That's yep. part of the problem is we've got really great drugs. Why do you need nanoparticles to, to enhance it? I think the nanosensors are going to be probably a little bit more of the focus for medicine than the, the actual therapeutics.